Colossians chapter 1, look at verse number 6. It says, I marvel that ye are so, so soon removed from Him that called you into the grace of Christ, into another gospel. Listen to what he's saying here. Verse 7. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Right? They're changing the truth into a lie. They're taking the, the simplicity of the gospel. They're complicating it. They're perverting the gospel. Look what he says. Verse 8. But though we, or an angel from heaven. Now he's saying that because there were people that were writing letters in his name. He's saying, hey, if you hear even of me saying it's salvation through any other method, don't believe it. Look what he's saying. Though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, then that which ye have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we had said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then ye have received, let him be accursed. Right. Now turn right. to 1 Peter chapter 4. The Bible's warning us here against false prophets that would, that would preach this false gospel. And God says that they're accursed. They are damned. Yeah. Right. The Bible also warns us about those where He says they are bastards and not sons of God. Amen. These are people that are not saved. Yeah. The title of my sermon this morning is Westboro Bastard Church. Right. Yeah. Amen. There is a church called Westboro Baptist Church and I'm going to show you from the Bible that they are not Christian. Yeah. They are not Baptist. They are not a church. And this guy that leads it, Fred Phelps, he is not a man of God. No, he's not. Right. They're in Topeka, Kansas. They're known for protesting the funerals of soldiers. Now, where do you find that in the Bible? Nowhere. Number one, where do you see anybody protesting a funeral? And the founder of this, Fred Phelps, is quoted as saying that Jesus Christ invented picketing. You understand how blasphemous this statement is? Yeah. Saying that Jesus invented this concept of standing on a corner with a sign, yelling at people, being offensive to people. In this Westboro Bastard Church, they use very vulgar images and vulgar speech, yeah. and they do it in the name of God, in the name of Christianity. And God is not happy with them. God is upset with them. And when there are many people that would go, oh, you're Baptist, oh, you must be like those people. No, I'm not. They are not Christians. They are not God's people. And I'm going to prove it from the Bible. And you think about it, Jesus was not a protester. Jesus wasn't a Protestant. All right, Jesus was not a picketer. In Matthew 12, he says, He shall not strive nor cry, neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. Right? right. Jesus wasn't in the street yelling at people. Right. He wasn't picking fights. He wasn't arguing with people. It says he won't strive. Jesus didn't go looking for a fight to argue doctrine with somebody. That's right. right? He went to preach the gospel, and the Pharisees came and picked a fight with him. Now, he stood his ground. Yeah. But what they do is totally different. Listen, here's a quote I want you to remember about Fred Phelps. If God does not bestow repentance upon you, you will never have it. You will never savingly repent of your sins. This is saying God is going to force works on you. God will force you into salvation by causing you to become a perfect person by stopping your sin. Let me tell you something. Nobody can stop sinning. That's right. Right. Any man that says he has no sin, they make God a liar. Yeah. The truth is not in them. That's They've right. perverted the gospel. That's right. This guy, Fred Phelps, is such a strange person, such a yeah. wicked person with a spotted history. And he let his church be ran, essentially, by his daughter for many years. And even after his passing, this church did not have a pastor. His daughter ran it which she's a lawyer. Now that has since changed, but this church is so unbiblical and so ungodly. I understand why the world hates them. Hey, I hate them. I think God would hate them according yeah. to what they do. That's right. So, like I said, I'm going to prove from the Bible that they are not Christian. They are not Baptist. They're not a church. They are wicked people. You're in 1 Peter chapter 4. Find verse number 15. The Bible says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a busybody in other man's matters. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. The Bible here is saying, hey, we will suffer as a Christian if you're, if you're really saved. There are going to come moments where people will scoff at you for having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice he says here what we shouldn't do as a Christian. We shouldn't be a busybody in other man's matters. There are many other things I could pick out of this, but some of the actions of this so-called church go directly against what the Bible calls a Christian. Turn to Acts chapter 11. 
in, you know, protesting the funerals of law enforcement officials, that is not godly. No. That is not righteous. And hey, I don't care how, however you feel about the law in general and some of the tyrannical laws in America. Yeah, we have a problem with our law system, but as a church, as born born again believers, you know, followers of Jesus Christ, we're not called to go protest the government or go protest some of these laws. Hey, there's a time to stand against them. When they tell us to do something that's ungodly, and you know, military veterans, the same thing. You know, they're just a bunch of they're they're actually very liberal anti-war protesters. And listen, I'm anti-war. We should be peacemakers. Sure, sure. There's a time and a place for war, it's defense, and some of the wars that America has been involved in are very unjust, but we are not called as a church to go out and protest the wars on the streets of America. It doesn't even make sense. It doesn't add up with the Bible. It's very strange, it's not of God. And I want you to understand the personality of this man. He has worked with the ACLU, right? A very socialist, communist group to change laws so they will defend vulgar speech. Now, as a Christian, do we need to defend vulgar speech? I want you to think about what, what they're involved in. You know, he actually supported Al Gore for president. He helped run the campaign and got a bunch of people to vote for Al Gore. You know, a real up, standing up Christian guy, Al Gore, right? The guy that so-called invented the internet. Like, wait a minute, this is a big contradiction. In Fred Phelps' family, there have been allegations of abuse come out from many people in his family. He has been sued for theft. He was disbarred as a lawyer for making false statements and for threatening people. So, I mean, as a person, as a whole, does this sound like the righteous man of God that should lead a church? No, no, no he boy. doesn't. Hey, he's a bastard pastor. Now the guy's dead now. He's in hell. Good. But I want you to understand what the Bible says about a pastor and who he is. The Bible says a pastor must be blameless. It says that they should be of good behavior. It says in the Bible that a pastor should have his children in subjection with all gravity. Yeah. Right? And it says that these things should first be proved. That a man should be found faithful. So we go back and look at the history of Fred, Fred Phelps. When was he ordained? How is it that he became a so-called man of God? Fred Phelps, in his own words, had a conversion, right? He had this conversion experience at a Methodist revival. And in that moment, he knew he got called to work for God. Listen, God doesn't just call people miraculously like an angel to come work. Now, I got called to preach. I was at work, and Pastor Mero said, Hey, Adam, what are you doing? We need you to go to Jackson. That's different, okay? That's the kind of calling that, that comes from man that's not of God. But look, he had this conversion experience at a Methodist revival at the age of 16. Then he went on a missions trip for a summer. He was in Utah for a couple months in a Southern Baptist church deemed him appropriate to become a pastor. They ordained him as a pastor without children. He was not proved. They didn't know the guy. He was only there for a very short period. And it's like, it's like one of these drive-through ordination services. Hey, what was your name again? Okay, got gotcha. you. Go be a pastor. Listen, that's wrong. That's wicked. The Bible's clear about the, uh, the order of a pastor. And he was not found faithful. He's not a biblical pastor. And anybody that's too rebellious to adhere to God's standards to become a pastor is a dangerous person. Yeah. They are dangerous. It's rebellion in their heart. They're going against what, well, no, I see fit that I should stand up and I should lead. Hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. Starting to sound like the devil there. Yeah. Now look, you're in Acts chapter 1. I'm sorry, 11. Acts chapter 11, verse number 1. Now, I want you to understand that they are not Christian because they do not believe the gospel. Verse 1, it says, in the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the Word of God. We go out preaching the Word of God so people will receive it. This is something that Fred Phelps is so opposed to of somebody receiving the Word of God. About understanding gospel and believing it. But yet that is Christianity. You hear it and you believe it. Look at verse 17. Acts 11:17. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as He did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, that what was I that I could withstand? Now look, in this verse, he's making... I want to show you the context of this chapter as we, as we move forward, right? He's telling you the gift that was received is eternal life, yeah. everlasting life. Fred Phelps and his group would say, no, the faith was the gift. God gave them repentance. God gave them the gift. But look, when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, He gives you the gift of everlasting life. This is what's being taught. That was eternal to those that trust in Jesus. Look at verse 20. 
And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. Right? Now, the Westboro Bastard Church doesn't preach the gospel. They yell in the streets. They do not make a presentation. Hey, you know Jesus died for your sins? You know He, he died and went to hell. He resurrected. It's a free gift. They don't preach that because they don't believe it. Yeah. Right. Instead, they do the turn or burn. Stop being a homo and become a Calvinist is the message of their church. Yep. And that's unacceptable to God. Look, it says in verse 21, And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. You hear what it says here? They chose to believe. They chose to change their mind and they became saved in their heart. Look at verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So Christians in context are those that put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as God, as Savior, the one and only way to heaven through faith alone. Anything else is not a Christian. I don't care if you make a corporation and put the word Christian in it. I don't care if you put it in your Facebook status. That doesn't make you a Christian. It's what's in your heart. Before God, you have a pure heart. You trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He knows it. He sees it. And that alone is acceptable when you stand before Him. Anything else will be rejected. They made a decision. They trusted the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. So here it said that they were assembled with the church for a year. So what is a church? Well, in context, we just read about a bunch of people that believed, became Christians, and they were hanging out together. That is a church. A church is for saved people. A church isn't a place to come get saved. Listen, and you know, when we have visitors, we preach the gospel. We make sure that they're truly saved. That's our job. That's our responsibility. But the rest of the world would say, come to our church and see what we have. Maybe you'll like it. And they never question their salvation. They never preach the gospel to them. And it's wrong. It's wicked. The church is made up of saved, born-again believers, not people that God chooses, which is what Fred Phelps teaches. Oh, well, God picked me. No, you're supposed to pick God. The church is people that chose by themselves to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ when they hear the gospel. That's what a church is. That priceless, everlasting gift of eternal life. That's, right. That's what a Christian is. Yeah, is. And listen, Fred Phelps and Westboro Baptist, they're not Christians because they follow this Catholic teaching of John Calvin. Yeah. John Calvin was a reprobate yeah. Protestant. Yeah. Yeah. Fred Phelps is like the poster boy for Calvinism. Yeah. And you know, and Calvinism is an anti-Christ doctrine. Yeah. If anybody ever said, oh, I'm Calvinist. Oh, okay. You can say, you mean like Westboro Baptist Church? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> you, you mean like the Catholic Church? Yeah. Some of the perverts, Augustine, that were in, that's what you're talking about? Amen. Because that's where it comes from. That's who they're lumped up with. I want you to understand this. If you go to their website, you say, well, what is their statement of faith? Whenever we find other churches in the area, hey, what is your statement of faith? What do you believe? Yeah. Are you trusting on the Lord for salvation or are you trying to work your way to heaven? Well, when you go to their website and look, here is the manifesto of Westboro Bastard Church. We are a Tulip Baptist Church. We believe and vigorously teach the five points of Calvin. Anyone preaching otherwise is a hell-bound false prophet. You understand what they're saying? They are holding the teachings of John Calvin above the Bible. Yeah, In right. his words, you want to become a Christian? You have to hear John Calvin and believe Calvinism. Then you can be God's special person. Yeah. Then God will pick you. This is wicked and perverse. Wicked. And you know, some people, oh, well, that's just, that's just hyper-Calvinism. Not all Calvinists are the same way. Let me tell you something. When I spent some time in Utah around the Mormons, there was this fundamentalist group. There were these hyper-Mormons. And they believed everything Joseph Smith said. They believed they had to have multiple wives to get into heaven. Well, the, the liberal Mormon church would say, oh, we don't believe that. We don't, we, no, 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 the church made a new decision. They've made a new decree. Well, you know, and it's the same thing with many other religions where they will, they will kind of back down. Dispensationalism be another good example. Oh, no, 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 that's hyper-dispensationalism. I don't believe everything that Darby and Schofield and Larkin wrote. Well, wait a minute. These men that created dispensationalism said that works were necessary for salvation at certain points in time. They said that salvation was different at different points in time. Uh, Peter Ruckman said that, that works were necessary in the book of Acts. 
But yet we're in the grace age. We're in the church age. And you see how dispensationalism also, you have people, well, I believe some of that, but not all of that. Well, Calvinism, unfortunately, is in this same category. Yeah. If you call yourself a Calvinist and you believe that the writings of John Calvin are inspired and worthy doctrine to be saved by, then you have to take it as a whole. And those writings are perverse, they are anti-God, and they change the gospel. That's right. Listen, something that Fred Phelps said, he said, Any preacher who declares that God loves everybody, that Christ died for everybody, and that it is your free will to accept or reject Christ, that makes the difference, is preaching a perverted notion of his own imagination and is corrupting the Word of God. Now what he's doing here is beginning to blur the lines. Okay? Jesus died for everybody. God, hey, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Amen. that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting Amen. life. Amen. Hey, did Jesus love everybody enough to die for Him? Yeah. Yes, He did. Now, does Jesus love Adolf Hitler as He burns in hell? Well, no, that wouldn't make sense. Okay, So what He does is blur the lines. And He's trying to cause confusion, but this is the fruit of Calvinism. He says that Christ died for everybody, right? He's saying you've perverted the Bible if you believe that Christ died for everybody. But hold on, that is what the Bible teaches. God does not love everyone always, right? But He has loved everyone enough to die for all the sins of the whole world and pay for the sins of the whole world, but it's up to you to believe that. It's up to us. It's our choice to receive the free gift of salvation. And you know, God does hate some people today. This is true. I believe God hates Westboro Baptist Church because they are bastards. They are not of God. Listen to something else that this guy said. The message of Galatians 1, 8 through 9 is this. That if any man preach any other gospel than the doctrines contained in the five points of Calvinism, let that man be damned forever. Are you kidding me? What does the Bible say in Revelation about changing the Word of God, about having the plagues upon you, about your name being taken out of the book of life? Hey, Fred Phelps, you're burning in hell now. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because he's perverted the simplicity of the gospel of Christ. Right. He's perverting the love of Jesus Christ. That he, hey, our, God hates fags. This is what they're known for, right? Fags are given over to that state. There is biblical support for some of what they say. There is such a thing as a reprobate doctrine. We're going to get into that. But, what they do is ungodly. The way they preach the gospel is ungodly. They are not of God. Here's another statement he says. If you do not know the five points of Calvinism, you do not know the gospel, but you only know some perversion of it. So wait a minute. John 3.16 where it says that he died for my sins. That's not good enough to get me to heaven according to this man. I have to go search out Calvinism where Calvin would say, you're, you might be a special person that God picked to be saved. Otherwise, you're somebody God picked to go to hell. And this is a very strange doctrine. Here's another thing he said. There is no true message of God in the earth aside from the doctrinal system commonly called the five points of Calvinism. All other religious messages and doctrinal systems are nothing but false, superstitious lies and fables. I want you to understand why this so-called church is so erroneous. They literally say you cannot be a Christian unless you know all five points of Calvinism and you believe all five points of Calvinism. He would even call those that are, call themselves Calvinists today, he would even say they're unsaved if they don't believe all five points like he did. And this church continues on. It's, it's filled up with his family and, and other people that have joined the church. It's mostly family. And listen, there is a true message of God in the earth aside from Calvinism. It's called the Holy Bible. Yeah, it's right. called the Scriptures of God. It's called the Oracles. And we put our faith and trust in what God said, not what a man said. Right. Not what any man said. Right. And listen, he gets... Where did John Calvin get the perversion? From Augustine of Hippo. Right? This guy was a perverted Catholic. That's where Calvin got his doctrine from. So, John Calvin... Augustine, Fred Phelps, they are in hell right now yeah, for are. perverting the gospel. That's right. Calvinism is a heresy that is anti-Christian. It is anti-faith, anti-biblical, and God says it is accursed. Yeah, it, is. it is damnable heresy. Amen. Now listen, on Tulip, I know we've preached about Calvinism a few times recently, so I'll, I'll be brief. We have flyers with a whole printout how to debunk all of Calvinism in depth. But I'm going to breeze through not just what 
a major, what John MacArthur would tell you about Calvinism, but I'm going to give you the quotes from Fred Phelps about Calvinism that line up with what John Calvin teaches. Hey, and John MacArthur. Look, he said, for to total depravity, right? Tulip is T-U-L-I-P, total depravity. The first one, he says, the essence of total depravity is the original sin. Now, where did the doctrine of original sin come from? Catholics. Catholics, that's right. He says, the essence of total depravity is the original sin of our father, Adam, whose tainted blood literally flows in all of our veins, typifying the total moral corruption that in in indelibly stamps all our characteristics and predisposes all of us to sin. This is not a Baptist doctrine. This is not Christian. This is a perversion. And you know, what he's saying is, Adam made me do it. Now look, I'm the only one in here that when I sin, I can say Adam made me do it. Because my name's Adam, okay? It is my choice. The Bible doesn't teach that. You're in First John, you're in John chapter 1, right? John chapter 1, look at verse number 7. It says, The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men, do you hear that? All men through him might be saved. He was not that light, verse 8 but was sent to bear witness of that light. Speaking of John the Baptist preaching about Jesus. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Right? When it says he lighteth every man that cometh into the world, I believe there's a book of life. Babies are born into it. There's a chance for you to get your name back by believing on it. Right? The Bible would teach like when David lost his son that he had out of wedlock with Bathsheba. David knew he would go to see the son because he knew he was saved. He knew that that baby being innocent would go to heaven. Yeah. Right? This is not what the Catholics believe. Right. This is not what the Calvinists believe. That's why they baptize babies for their so-called salvation or sanctification. And you know, another example is in Matthew 18 where it talks about what people would call a guardian angel where it says their angel doth always stand before the face of my father. Listen, it is a biblical concept. Children are safe in the Lord until they have a, uh, the, until they cross that line and there's a point where they need to get saved on their own. Right? God loves the little children of the world. He protects their souls until they can understand the Gospel. They cannot be condemned against the Gospel. This is not what Calvinism teaches. Calvinism teaches you were born either for heaven or hell not a side of nothing you can do. It's not your choice. It's not your ability. You are so depraved. You're so wicked. You can't even listen to the Gospel and believe it. This is a strange doctrine. Look at verse number 11. It says, He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. Do you understand Jesus is saying, in the Bible here He's saying that there were people that chose to reject Jesus. This also goes against Calvinism. Look at verse 12. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Again, it goes right back to your choices. Turn to Titus chapter 1. Now the next point in Calvinism is the unconditional election. The U in Tulip. So what does old Fred say about that? Listen, he says, My friend, if you do not heartily believe the message embraced in the so-called five points of Calvinism, it is because you're not of God. You have not been born of God. You have not been taught of God. You are seized with a powerful spirit of error. Unconditional election. Here's how he teaches it. If you don't believe in Calvinism, you're not saved. Right? No Calvin, no God. This is not Bible. This is not Christianity. If you don't believe you're special according to what John Calvin wrote, then you're not a Christian. This is not Christianity. Listen to another quote. He says, My friend, if you do not thoroughly understand the five points of Calvinism, and if you do not heartily love the, five, love the five points of Calvinism, you are ignorant of the true nature and attributes of the Almighty God. You do not know the Lord, and you are yet in the midnight of darkness and religious superstition. He is teaching salvation by faith in Calvin. He is not teaching salvation by faith in Jesus Christ. It's by faith in John Calvin. Right. Strange doctrine. Yes, it is. He also says... Unconditional election means that God made His choice. It's more like your choice for you is what he's getting at. God made His choice without any conditions attached and without any consideration whomsoever to merit or virtue in the objects of His choice. The selection of those He chooses to save was purely arbitrary. 
and on God's part. You know, arbitrary means like, you could say random. I don't like that word. I, I think it's a bogus word. But, you know, the, the way people use random or, you know, on a whim. He's saying God just on a whim picked some people to be saved and other people He picked and chose to live to go to hell. This is totally wicked. There is a condition though. He says there is not. There is a condition. It is to believe. Yeah. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Revelation 22 says, whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. You want to be saved? It's up to you. It's your will. It's not God's will. He's not going to force that on you. Choose you this day whom you will serve. You have to make a choice for yourself. Amen. Mom, you can't choose for your children. Dad, you can't choose for your wife. You have to choose for yourself. It's an educated choice. Here's the gospel. Will you receive it? Do you believe it? Will you trust in it alone for salvation? It's not God randomly picks you for salvation. That is not salvation. You're in Titus chapter 1. Look at verse number 1. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect. Right? This is the word they take out of context. It's unconditional election. How did Paul become elect? Look, and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised before the world began. Amen. But hath in due times manifested His word through preaching, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. Now listen, Westboro Baxter Church, they don't preach. Nope. Calvinists, most Calvinists do not preach the gospel because they believe it's not of them to get somebody saved. God's going to turn the light bulb on for them. And they're just going to write, oh, I'm a Calvinist. I woke up saved. Right? God says here we're commanded to preach it. Why? Because He's made us a promise of everlasting life and we have to acknowledge it and believe it, put our trust in it to be saved. Turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. So the next part is limited atonement in Tulip. Fred says, Christ died for the sins of a certain fixed number of persons known in Scripture as His elect. The Lord Jesus did not die on the cross for everybody, but only His elect. And in fact, all the billions of mankind from Adam to the end of the world, except for a relatively small remnant, are certain to spend eternity in hell. Again, he's saying God made people just to watch them burn. That is wicked. Yeah. They are making God look wicked. Yeah. And when the world looks at that, they say, well, well, that's dumb. That doesn't even make sense according to the Bible. And they reject Christianity as a whole. Yeah. Look, another statement. Actually, in John 2, Jesus, Jesus the righteous, right? He says, he says, the propitiation for our sins was Jesus the righteous, it says. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Wait a minute. Did Jesus die for sodomy? Yes. Did He die for murder? Yes. Did He die for fornication? Yes. Drunkenness? Yes. The sins of the whole world. Like it or not, that's a fact according to the Bible. Salvation's a free gift. If you reject it and continue to live in sin, you have rejected your own forgiveness. In 2 Corinthians 5, He says He died for all. Every person in here. Everything you've ever done wrong. He knows it. He knows what you will do wrong. He's offering you forgiveness. And that forgiveness is not applied if you don't believe it. If you don't apply it yourself. If you, don't, if you reject it, it's your choice. Listen, the next point is irresistible grace. The eye and tulip. And here's what he says. This blessed doctrine teaches us that when the Holy Ghost sets out to bring to a man, a man to Christ, that man, sooner or later, is drawn irresistibly to fear the Lord, to fear the fires of hell, to repent of all his sins, to earnestly seek the Lord until he finds him and becomes a true disciple of Jesus Christ, and thereupon takes his cross and forsakes all to follow him, bringing forth fruits of repentance day by day. Listen, this is the works of the law that he's teaching here. Yeah. He is saying that the Holy Ghost will make you fear God immediately. Now wait a minute. The Bible tells us to teach our children the fear of the Lord. The Bible says in the church we are to teach the fear of the Lord. Do you know what that means? It's your choice. Right. Salvation is a choice. To obey God's commandments is a choice. Right. To fear the chastisement of the Lord is a choice. Yeah. Right? 
We're to, we're to preach it to Christians. And here he says, nope, he just turns it on. You'll automatically fear. He also says, you will automatically repent of your sins. Wow. Talk about that is one of the most damnable heresies. That is the subtlety of the devil trying to say, you want to go to heaven, you got to turn over a new leaf. you got to be willing to turn from your sin. And the people that preach that are the ones that live the worst. Yeah. The Bible says, you do always... You do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. But yet he says, oh, it's irresistible. God's going to force you to repent of your sins. That's not what God said. That's what John Calvin said. That's what Fred Phelps said. You're in Romans chapter 10. Look at verse number 16. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Presias saith, Lord, who hath believed our report. Now here he's saying they didn't obey it. They were given the gospel. They were commanded to believe. You're commanded to trust in the Lord, but not everybody's done that. There are people that have said, I don't believe that. I don't want to believe that. I'm, I'm enjoying myself. I don't want to follow God. Right? There are people that reject it. He said they have not obeyed the gospel. They have not believed it. And listen to what he says on this. Just as faith is a sovereign gift of a sovereign God. In other words, it's not your faith. It's not your choice. God chose for you. God gave you the faith. That's wicked in itself. He says, even so is repentance. And if God does not bestow saving faith upon you, you have none. If He does, it is irresistible, and you have it. If God does not bestow repentance upon you, you will never have it. You will never savingly repent of your sins. You will be an impenitent. You will go to hell impenitent. Repentance is a sovereign gift of a sovereign God. He is saying it is irresistible to repent of your sins. Now listen, hey, it's, it's man's nature to feel like I need to work my way to heaven. Well, surely I should have some part in my own salvation. I know God opened the door, but i got to do the works, right? Hey, that's, that's the nature. That's the flesh. And that's wrong. And Fred Phelps is trying to take his logic, the logic of John Calvin, and pervert it and turn it into the Gospel. Look at verse number 3 there in Romans 10. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Amen. Hey, in this same chapter it says, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Right? There are none righteous, no, not one. Nobody's perfect. Nobody is sinless. But, if you trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's as if your soul and spirit are preserved blameless. God looks down. He doesn't see the sin in your flesh. He's forgiven that. Jesus already paid for that. He looks at your heart and He sees your soul. You are preserved. You're good to go. Now turn to Hebrews 11. But that is not what they believe. That is not what they teach. And most Calvinists fall in the same boat. The last point in Tulip is perseverance of the saints. According to him, he says that means that each of those whom God the Father elected to be saved will thereafter inevitably and certainly preserve in this faith from all the remaining days on earth. And yet many of his own family that were Calvinists, were Christian, now have left. Now take this stance of, I don't believe in Calvinism anymore. In fact, I reject God as a whole. So, according to his perseverance of the saints, which, by the way, is yet still works, they're saying that you will be preserved so long as you endure to the end. As long as you try to remain sinless, as long as you try to reject sin, you'll be one of God's children. And again, that is not the gospel. Listen, another thing he says, the Christian shall repent of his failure. Clearly stated, if you love sin, you are no child of God. Now listen, all of us in here fall in a category of having flesh. The flesh loves sin. If you're saved, your spirit, you love God. Right? Romans, it talks about that there's a war in our members. My spirit wants to follow God. My flesh wants to follow the world. Yeah. I have to die daily. I have to make this decision every day. And yet he's saying, oh, if you enjoy sin, you're not a Christian. How contrary. How, I mean, this is in direct opposition of the Word of God. And it's the old flesh versus the spirit thing. Your flesh won't go to heaven. Your flesh can't stop sinning. It's your soul. It's your spirit. That is righteous before God. And in the world, in the logic of mankind, we would say, well, if I can just get my body good enough, God might accept me. 
but our body will never be good enough. Hey, when we're resurrected, then it will, but it's not going to be this body. Right. 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 Here's another quote. If when you give into temptation, you are not cut to the heart afterward, if the fact that you have offended against the Lord God is not followed by genuine contrition and repentance, it is proof you have never been born again. So he's saying the evidence of your salvation is works. It's, it's works. I mean, the whole thing, he brings it back to works. They say, oh, it's, there's nothing you can do, but yet it's works, 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 works. Every step of the way, Calvinism teaches lordship salvation. You're in Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse number 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Right? For by faith the men that were before us got saved by faith. Today the only way to get saved is by faith. Look at verse number 6. But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is. Right? You have to believe that Jesus is God. And that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Now Calvinism would teach that God seeks you. God picked you. You can't go looking for God. You can't go searching for God. But yet the Bible says, search, you'll find. Right? Knock, He'll open. This is a principle. Ask, it'll be given unto you. God wants you to come looking for Him. Yeah. And I think He puts it in men's hearts to try to figure it out. And those that reject it in their heart, God says, okay, come on. You need to stop. I'm still going to try. I'm still going to come hear you. You're going to hear the Gospel. And if they continue to reject, God may give up on them. Go to Romans 9. Now the fact that they call themselves Baptist, in their own words they say it's not, they don't real, they're not with most Baptists. They disagree with Southern Baptists. They disagree with Independent Baptists. They would call themselves a Primitive Baptist or some people call it an Old School Baptist. And he says the only reason they keep the name Baptist on their church is because it was started with that name. All right, now we here, we call it a Baptist because that means you pretty much know what I believe. Yeah. Right now, again, today all bets are off. People use the name Baptist. They don't believe in the inspired Word of God. They don't believe in the King James. They don't believe in salvation by faith alone. Yeah. Right? They, they, some of them even baptize babies. Some of the Southern Baptist weirdos. There's some weird things out there today that call themselves Baptist, but we stay with it because hey, John was a Baptist. Jesus instructed his disciples to Baptist and, and baptize, and that's what we do. Now, Christian Baptist, Christian Baptist are different from Calvinist Baptists. Yeah. This is the most important thing you need to understand. There, there are Southern Baptists that claim to be Christian, they claim to be Baptist, but they are not. Those Baptists came from a different line. They came from protesting the Catholic Church, they came from out of the Catholic Church, and they started, it was Presbyterian and Methodist and all these other camps and Lutherans, and they well, hey, we'll, we'll get some Baptists too. And all they did was borrow a name to try to say that you know they're a majority. And, you know, Calvinism came out of the Catholic protesters and Christian Baptists predate Catholicism by 300 years. And really even before that, there was a church in the wilderness, right? God has always had a body of believers by different names. Yeah, we're called elect, we're called believers, we're called the children of God because of our faith. Yeah, that's right. Now, Fred Phelps has a granddaughter that left the movement. And she left because of Calvinism, not because of Christianity. Right. She left not because of the Word of God, but because of the perverted doctrines of Augustine of Hippo mm -hmm. that John Calvin copied, and then other men have copied. Fred Phelps, in his deranged mind, this madman with the tools of perverts, has created this doctrine that is causing his own family to reject God. Yeah, preach it. God designed some people to go to hell is what they teach. Right? You may be the, one of those people that God just said, you know what, I'm going to let you be born and live a life just so you can go to hell. God doesn't, that doesn't please God. That's not God. You all have a chance of salvation. That is not what Calvinism teaches. In Romans 9.21, one of the verses that she uses, it says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? Now listen. They teach a reprobate doctrine. Reprobate means rejected. This is a biblical doctrine, but not the way that they teach it. Right? They teach you're born that way, and there's nothing you can do to change it. That's not godly. In the Bible it says, if you reject me, I'll reject you. Right? You go back to Jeremiah 6, they rejected God and His law. 
Therefore, God rejected them and called them reprobate silver. Right. It was their choice. You go back to Cain and Abel, and God gave Cain another chance. Sin lies at the door, and Cain rejected him. Cain was cursed because he rejected God. Therefore, God rejected him. Calvinism does not teach this. And this is, I believe, one of the oldest stories in the Bible when you think about it. You're born neutral. You choose to be positive, a son of God, to by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Or you choose to go live for the devil. Listen, there are people in the middle. There are people that might even seem that they're over here. And we preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is a free gift. We want them to know the truth. They have to hear it to reject it. And people that continue to reject God, God will ultimately reject them. And some of them on this earth are rejected today yeah. as they still have breath in their lungs, as they still walk and live life. And they're working for the devil. Yeah. They are working for the devil. I believe Fred Phelps was one of these such guys. Yeah. The Bible warns us that a false prophet will pervert the gospel, that they should be accursed. I believe every reprobate is a form of a false prophet yeah. in that they're going to want you to believe in their way. Now, according to Romans 1, we can see the evidence of somebody that is a reprobate that has become a homosexual, right? They have, their, their, their affection is seared. They have a lust for uncleanness. Now, I do not believe every reprobate is necessarily a homosexual. I would say they're probably a pervert if you look at the descriptions. But this is where people get mixed up on. You know, I believe there are many false prophets that are total reprobates, unsavable, because they are willingly, knowingly, preaching against the God of the Bible. Yeah. They're changing it and corrupting it for monetary gain, for, for physical profit. You think about even the angels in heaven had a choice. Will you believe? Will you obey? Well, many rebelled. God gave the angels free will, and He gave human beings free will. Now listen, once you're saved, you're always saved. Yeah. It is an everlasting gift that He will never take away. That's right. And on the same side, on the other side of the ledger, once you're damned, once you're cursed, once you're reprobate, there's no going back. Right. This is very important to understand. Now, the, the Westboro Bastard Church doctrine is this, that God is equally active in causing the salvation of the elect as He is involved in causing the damnation of the reprobate. God is forcing the perverts to be perverts is what they teach. The reprobate are those who God did not choose to be saved and will therefore end up in hell, right? No personal choice to reject God. God just forced it on you. God is actively involved in causing people to sin in order to bring about their damnation, right? When you hear somebody say sovereignty, this is what they're talking about. I mean, generally speaking, do I believe God is sovereign? Uh, yeah, right? He's in charge. But does that mean He forces my daily decision? Does that mean He forces my thoughts moment by moment? No. Does that mean He forces my hand and causes me to do both good and evil? No. no. Else why should I pay for my sin? Why should I suffer on the earth and have chastisement of the Lord because I broke His law? It's my choice. That is not what they teach. They teach when they say sovereignty, that means God makes bad people do bad things. Yeah. And you fill in the blank with the extent of that. It's strange, it's wicked, it's perverse, it is not of God. Now they use Romans 9 to teach this. Look at verse number 17. He says, the Lord says here, For the Scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Now listen, Pharaoh was allowed to rule the earth by God. God let him have this power, this dominion, this kingdom for a purpose so that he could set his people free. But yet Pharaoh hardened his heart against God. God knew he was going to make this decision. So God wanted everybody to know, hey, I, I want to let everybody see the most powerful man in the world go against me, choose to hate me, and then I'm going to show you how powerful I am. Right? Look at the next verse. Therefore, hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy. And whom he will, he hardeneth. Now if you know the context of Pharaoh, it says half a dozen times, Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh agreed, yeah, we'll let him go. And then Pharaoh hardened his heart. Why? Because he hated God. Yeah. He was against God. So then it says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. It wasn't the first time that he rejected God. He was given many chances. 
Many chances. God is patient and long-suffering. He puts up with a lot of our stuff for a long time. Be thankful for that. But even with this guy who God knew his ultimate choice, he didn't harden his heart immediately. He let Pharaoh harden his own heart time after time. And then he said, okay, now I'll harden your heart. Now I'll see your conscience. Now I'll let you cross that line and you're done. You've been rejected. Look at verse 19. Thou wilt say unto me, Why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Right. So did, God didn't force Pharaoh. God let him rule. Some people would find fault. Well, God, why do you let evil men rule? Why do you let like the reprobate Obama and the reprobate Trump, why do you let those freaks rule our country? God, why don't you put a righteous man in charge? Right. God is allowing that to happen. Hey, it's not for me to question God. Right? He's doing things I don't know. He's working things I don't understand. They're there for a reason. God has allowed it. I'm not going to question God. Look at the next verse. Nay, nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What? If God, willing to show his wrath, and make his power known, endured with much long suffering, the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Why is God patient with evil people? Why does he let them exist? Why doesn't he just strike them dead on the spot? God is teaching us something about his long suffering, right? Because there's a point in all of our lives where we were unsaved, right? If we want God to go get those bad guys real quick, what if, I mean, wouldn't that apply to us? Right? Shouldn't God... Hey, there's many of us in here that could probably say because of my actions, I deserve death. God would look down and say, no, I'm judging you. No, I'm going to end your life now. But thank God He's merciful. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He wants to give people a choice. He loves people. That's why He died for them. Yeah. He's given them a way out. And it's so easy. But everybody else wants to make it confusing. Look what He says in verse 23. And that He might make known the riches of His glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory. Right? God seeing our choice of faith, he's given us this destination of heaven. He's afore prepared something for us. Yeah. His riches of mercy, it's a beautiful thing to understand, that precious free gift of salvation. It's not of works of righteousness which I do. It's not of me repenting of my sins. If you're in sin and you're unsaved, you don't have to stop sinning to become saved. You only have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. Trust Him alone for salvation. That's right. Now turn back to Romans 8, verse 28. So the verses in here, they use them out of context to teach that strange doctrine that God designed certain people to go straight to hell. And that's wicked as hell. Yeah. For this reason, I believe, is one of the main reasons Fred Phelps is in hell. Yeah. He has hardened his heart against the Bible to parrot John Calvin. Look at Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, He did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. There's a lot in these two verses. I want to try to make it as simple as possible. Number one, we love Him, right? Why? Because He first loved us. But look what He says in 29. He, those he did foreknow. What did he know about you before the foundation of the world? Before you were foreign in the womb? Your choices. Your sin because he paid for it, right? Knowing your choice to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, he has predetermined you will be conformed to the image of his son. Now this is where Calvinists make it weird. They say, see, you're going to be forced into this box. You're going to repent of your sins. You're going to live perfect in the flesh. But this is not what the Bible's teaching. It's teaching your spirit, your soul will be preserved, right? And you'll be resurrected. It says here that He was the firstborn among many sons. Jesus Christ was born again. He was the first begotten from the dead. He was given a supernatural body. That is the image of God that we will be conformed to. It's not talking about your flesh. It's talking about your spirit. Yeah, that right. one simple misunderstanding, you can take all sorts of doctrine out of, out of context. In fact, much of Romans is mistaught and misunderstood because they apply it to the flesh where you ought not. 
where it's talking about the Spirit. Now go to Romans chapter 1. We're going to end with this. Romans chapter 1. So again, salvation is a free gift. God lets you choose for yourself whether you believe that Jesus was God, whether you believe that He's your Savior and died for all your sins, it's up to you. But, if you reject it, you will end up in hell. If you reject it too much while you're on earth, not just reject it, but you learn to hate God and hate the Gospel, the Bible says you'll become a reprobate. Look at verse 21. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. They knew God. It was evident. We're all born with an understanding of God, of a right and wrong. And the more that you reject God, it, he talks about your, your imagination. It's in your own mind that you make the choice of where you're going to spend eternity. That choice is made while you're alive on the earth. And so, by rejecting God, it says that their foolish heart was darkened. Elsewhere it says their conscience becomes seared. Look at verse 24. He starts out, Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness. God gave them up to uncleanness. So because you wanted to harden your heart against God, God says, okay, go do those strange things. Go be a weirdo. Go be a pervert. I'm going to harden your heart. You're going to act like an animal. Because a normal human being cannot do the things that a reprobate does. Yeah. These people that mess with children and do homo acts, right. that is so unnatural, so against nature, yeah. God has to let somebody harden their heart to become that way. Right. In verse 26, for this cause God gave them up to vile affections. They do not understand true love. They don't love God, first of all. They don't love their family. They don't love their brethren. They don't love strangers. We're called to do that. We're called to go preach the gospel to strangers. And some of them might be reprobates. But look, we're not on a reprobate hunt. We're not out there. Oh, these people might be reprobates. Let's go protest them. Let's go picket them. That's not of God. We yeah. preach the gospel. It is setting the captives free. It's getting people out of spiritual bondage. And it's totally free. Yeah. In 28, he says, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. This happened because of their own choices. God didn't create somebody just to put them in hell without an option to choose. Every man must choose for himself. Every lady must choose for themselves. This is the, the most basic doctrines in the Bible. But yet Calvinism perverts it. Westboro Bastard Church perverts it. John Felt or Fred Phelps, this guy is in hell because he perverted the simplicity of the gospel. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Let me leave you with this thought. Beware lest any man spoil beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Listen up, Christian. Beware. If you have a, a, a friend, another Christian, in another church, in another walk of life, a family member, and they say, but, but this doctrine here, look at this book. I want you to read this book that a man wrote yeah. about man's tradition. Well, you don't understand it yet because you haven't read this book. Yeah. Whoa. Beware. Beware. Yeah. Beware. This is what happened to Fred Phelps. He had to make his own decision to cross that line and go against the Word of God. He had to darken his own mind when he sees the obvious Scriptures and just say, nope, nope, Calvinism. I see Calvinism. He made that choice. And he's burning in hell because of it. Right. We stand for the truth. We stand against lies and against these false prophets. Amen. Now listen, as you go out soul winning today, if you find a Calvinist, love them. Preach the Gospel to them. And understand where they're coming from now. Let's pray. Father God, thank You for the Word. Thank You for the free gift of the Gospel. Lord, we're amazed at what You're doing in this church and we just love everything that, that You've blessed us with. And Lord, I pray You would give us the wisdom to continue to grow spiritually first and foremost. Thank You, Jesus. Amen.